from all over the world and uh, we welcome you to the very first episode of our mountain movers program um, i know you are excited and we are excited uh, to see what the lord is going to do through this a uh, new program that we are starting today so uh, before we um, go on to explain about the program uh, and, and invite our guest speaker for the day uh, i would like to uh, welcome uh, Uh, our apostle uh, to start this whole program that we are starting with a new format and a new concept uh, our apostle joel in coimbatore uh, could you please uh, start by committing this whole program into the hands of god uh, not just today but uh, many more episodes that we will have on the topic that we are discussing for the month of june and several months we will go on for sure as the lord leads So please commit this time and everyone on this program to the very hands of God. Uh, let's commit this program as the first fruit unto the Lord and honor him with it. Please over to you uh, our apostle. Thank you. Thank you brother Sudesh. It's wonderful that I feel it is a great privilege to start the inaugural prayer for this great program that's coming in. the mountain movers and thank you gokul for all the goodness uh we thank uh, god for our prophet and uh, brother john prabaharan because god had given him a vision and uh, he is able to sponsor these programs design them plan them program them and then uh, connect it with the, the correct uh, uh, servants of god who had been chosen for those uh, uh, performances and the ministries so we thank god for him and his family and jilam ministries so let's pray and i bring greetings to brother uh, pastor mohan virakun this evening and it's a great privilege to even pray for him who is the first uh, mountain moving or mountain moving power that's going to touch us today with the mighty anointing of the holy spirit and we have great expectations coming in for these months thank god let's pray our dear heavenly father we praise you and glorify you we worship you we adore you we bring all the our heartful thanks we unite our hearts tonight lord because this is great thing that is happening in this earth this is the most important uh, time of period in the history when we the servants of god and the believers of the body of christ have to understand uh, israel first of all as a nation and the past and the present and the future history uh, that is designed by god and is being mentioned in the word of god the bible lord we thank you for this mountain movers program which is going to bring us face to face with the reality of understanding the truth in the bible about the god's chosen people right from the days of abraham we thank you lord for bible teachers and uh, scholars like our uh, pastor mohan virakun who had studied and spent a lifetime uh, learning to understand the the intricacies that are there in the word that with the hidden treasure and we know lord that he is chosen for the body of christ and maybe he had already uh, given this vision and understanding to thousands of people around the world and now lord we as a team under the leadership of uh, our prophet john prabaharan uh, we come together uh, uh, waiting to see what the lord is going to uh, reveal to us uh, some of the hidden truths and the lord we pray that you would uh, anoint our dear pastor in a very special way that he could bring it clearly to make us understand where we stand and what's going to happen and how we are united as spiritual uh, israelites uh, to this messianic uh, people lord we thank you 
for this wonderful opportunity that had been given to us. We thank you, Lord, for Brother Sudesh, who had, uh, who had done uh, great in the past episodes uh, with the Hidden Treasures program. And now, Lord, he has taken up the responsibility of uh, uh, conducting these uh, wonderful uh, episodes, uh, even for the mountain movers. We thank you. We thank uh, you, Lord, for Gokul, who is undertaking the technicalities of this uh, uh, great uh, uh, broadcast that we have through the Zoom and all. Uh, uh, so we, we, we commit ourselves, Lord, and we pray that this is going to bring an awakening among the past, especially, that they could feed the flock in the future with this divine unction and divine anointing and divine revelation that is being given to us in these days. We give all the glory, honor, and only to you, Lord, for in Jesus' mighty name, we inaugurate this, inaugurate this program for glory of God, the mountain movers. Amen and amen. Thank you, Brother Sudesh. God thank please. you, Apostle Joel. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and, and always uh, praying over us and blessing us to continue the work the Lord has called us to do uh, faithfully for his glory and glory alone. Um, so uh, before I invite uh, the, the speaker uh, who's, be, who's going to be having the conversation with us today, uh, it is my duty to uh, help you understand uh, this program uh, since we are starting this as our first episode, uh, this is going to be a new format that we are starting. Uh, the reason why we are calling it Mountain Movers is uh, in our previous uh, uh, season of uh, the Hidden Heroes, we have been meeting with people who have been accomplishing great things for the glory of God in their own personal life and ministry we heard their testimonies and we spoke about how the Lord moved in and through their life. Now, moving on to mountain movers, uh, we take a different shift altogether. Rather than speaking about their life, their testimonies and their stories, uh, what we would be looking forward to is the revelation that God has given to each minister of the gospel or, or the preachers that we invite on this platform so that we can uh, dig into those revelations that the Lord has given through his spirit. Uh, as our Apostle Joel uh, prayed, some of these people have spent their whole lifetime searching, studying, analyzing. It, it, it doesn't come easily. Sometimes the Lord calls you to do something and they, we have to put years, decades behind that calling to be the best in that. And that's the reason why we call it mountain movers, because they climb that particular mountain. And in that journey, uh, they have to make certain sacrifices. Sometimes uh, uh, they have to go through hardships. Climbing a mountain is not easy. Uh, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, it takes discipline. It takes uh, sometimes even going through difficult circumstances. But these people have climbed the mountain and they come on top so that they are able to, from the top of the mountain, uh, shed light on those who are still climbing the mountain. So this is the reason why we call it Mountain Movers. Now, talking about the uh, program format, uh, this is not going to be a, a one-sided discussion where I would be asking questions from our guest speaker on the topic and they would be answering. Now, we want it to be as interactive at, as it can be by allowing our viewers to ask questions because uh, when, when we talk about a particular topic, uh, you may have certain questions about a topic. You may have certain doubts, doubts, or you may have a different point of view. So we want to open the forum for you to ask questions and, and allow you to clear them or, or gain more clarity on certain subjects that we'll be discussing. Now, for this purpose, uh, we sent out a link uh, yesterday with uh, three areas we'll be discussing in the next four weeks so that you're able to think about those things and enter the questions in that uh, 
link that we sent. Now, for some reason, uh, you're not familiar with the internet, the technology, online platforms. Uh, don't worry about it. You can still type your questions uh, on the chat box and we'll try to answer as uh, many questions as possible as the time allows us uh, because we will have the usual one hour mark uh, for every episode. Now, you don't have to worry if you are not able to answer a question today, please send your questions. We can take those questions and we can pass it to our speaker. And the next episode, we will definitely start by answering those questions. So this program is conducted so that you can benefit from that, so that the Lord will reveal the truths that you need to hear and every speaker invited to the program is handpicked by Brother John Prabhakaran. So uh, based on his uh, relationships and understanding and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he handpicks people. So uh, you can be assured these are people that he recommends and endorses. So you can, uh, without hesitation, ask your questions, clarifications that you want to find out about. And then we'll try to navigate this journey where everyone is benefiting even as we conduct this program. Now, without taking too much uh, time of our speaker, today uh, our topic is uh, Israel. And this is going to be the topic for the rest of the month of June for, for until we uh, go to the end of this month. Every Monday, we'll be talking about Israel. Now, when we talk about Israel, there's a lot of things we can talk about. Uh, but we are focusing primarily on three uh, subtopics. One is the history of Israel as a nation. And the second one is Israel in the plan of God. Now, that's a very important thing. And sometimes people even don't know whether Israel is in the plan of God. So we need to discuss that. And third thing, of course, I, I believe in the in the... Uh, the last few weeks, we'll be talking about the, the events that lead to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and Israel plays a very crucial role in that uh, journey. So you can't take Israel out of the equation. They are in the plan of God, in, particularly in the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me uh, welcome our, our uh, guest speaker for this month. Uh, Pastor Mohan Virakorn is from Sri Lanka, but right now he's in Australia uh, due to the pandemic. He's been there. Uh, he's not a, a stranger to some of you who have uh, watched our Eden Eros program. So let me welcome welcome you, Pastor Mohan. Thank you very much for joining us. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Shalom, Pastor uh, Mohan. Uh, it's a great joy to have you with us once again. Uh, of course, in a different setting. Uh, this time we have you uh, almost like a rabbi uh, with, with your uh, shawl with you. And, and I'm sure you have your chauffeur somewhere around you. Uh, or if you didn't bring it, okay. In the next episodes, we will see you because um, usually when you meet Pastor Mohan Virakorn, uh, you would she see him with a shawl and a chauffeur. And, and uh, he, he, he starts off everything with, with uh, blowing the chauffeur and making that sound of heaven. And, and making the way for the Lord to actually minister. Now, Pastor Mohan, uh, uh, as, as we discussed, a um, few things that we will be discussing in the next few weeks, and we will be allowing our uh, viewers to also ask questions. Now, to set the context and start our discussions, uh, one of the things that I personally grew up uh, many, many years ago as a young Christian was uh, what is known as replacement theology. That is to say, every time we read Israel in the Bible, we say, oh, that is talking about us, the modern day Christians. Israel is no more. The Lord is not with Israel anymore. They are not a nation. So this is talking about us, the church. So basically replacing Israel with the church. And uh, then, of course, the other side is, uh, of course, now there is a greater understanding of Israel uh, in, in the plan of God. So can we start by talking about this? Uh, what is the role that Israel plays 
And do they still have any relevance in the workings of God and why is it important? So I'll let you start off by talking about that. Yes. Uh, thank you, Suresh, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you for all the world viewers all around the world. Thank you for joining. It's early morning here in Sydney, but I bring greetings to you for the City of Peace. I say, Shalom Alechem. And I say, uh, Dabi, may the peace be upon you, every one of you. Before I say anything, I just want to say a prayer from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, as it is the custom and it is a standard for all the Jews around the world. Let's bow in prayer. Shama Israel, Adonai Lohinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malchuto, Leulam, Bahin, Levakatai, Tudonai Lohinu, Vekol, Levakau Vekol, Neshafa Vekol, Mordeka. He, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name for his kingdom is forever and ever. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Sudesh. Anyway, once again, before I go anywhere, I just want to mention that if you read the scriptures, the word Zion and Israel and Jerusalem is mentioned over thousands of times. Okay? Hear me very well. So, first of all, it's a mandate, it's a covenant agreement within God and his children, which we call the Jewish nation, which we all belong. It is a mandate that we stand and we unite and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. If you read Psalm 122, verse 6, in the Hebrew Bible, they say, Shalom, Shalom, Jerusalem." Yishlayu Ahawail, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May the prosper that love thee, peace within your walls and prosperity within thy gates. It's a mandate for every born again Christian, especially, not only for the Israelites, everyone, if you're a follower of Christ, that we have to pray for God's city. Now, why is Jerusalem more important? Why is Jerusalem? Now we see the center of the universe. If you read the Bible before GPS or before Google, before any technology came, the manufacturer who created the universe sent a place, Jerusalem, or God's nation, the nation of Israel, right at the center of the universe. Right? If you go and check the map today, Jerusalem is placed at the center. Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5 says, I have made Jerusalem at the center of the universe with all nations surrounding Israel. Now, why Jerusalem? If you see the heart of the universe, right? Heart of the world is Jerusalem, right? The center of the world is also Jerusalem. The soul of the world is also Jerusalem. That means if you see heaven, which is spiritual, and if you see earth, right? which is the physical, Jerusalem is the center of the world where heaven will meet the earth. That is why Jerusalem is very, very important and God's nation and God's people. So in Psalm 121, verse 4, it says, Israel. He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. If you see Psalm 137, verse 5, it says, Imesh kahek perjulayim, tishka yemini. It says, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget his kill, and let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth, is Jerusalem is not above my chief joy. If you see right throughout the Bible, right, why Jerusalem has been given more importance than any city in the world. It does not say for us to pray for any city in the world. I know we are from uh, about 196 countries representing all over the universe, according to the United Nations. But there's only one city, one nation, and one capital that the Almighty God, the manufacturer of the universe, whom you and I believe, says, you must remember my city. Now, for Christians, why is Jerusalem? So I want to give a background why Israel has not been replaced. If you go to the word of God for the new Testament Christians or the followers of Yeshua, which we call Jesus, Jerusalem is important because Jesus or Yeshua, Jesus, was born 
in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, right? So the capital is Jerusalem. Bethlehem is like a suburb. So Jerusalem is the place where he was born. When you say Bethlehem, we say Bethlehem, Jerusalem. So where did he do ministry? Or where did he start his ministry? Where was the foundation stone of the universe? It is placed in Jerusalem. So he started the ministry. The word of God says the light went from Jerusalem to the ends of the world. So you must know the center, the epicenter of the world spiritually is Jerusalem, right? Now, when, when, Jesus, when Jesus came, right, he came as a Jew. And before that, the Old Testament, they never talked about Yeshua. It is the pinnacle, this is the center, and it is the foundation stone for God to create the universe. So wherever God spoke, he spoke about the city of God. Now for Jesus, if you see the Bible, there were two instances where Yeshua wept. The first place he wept was at the funeral of uh, uh, Lazarus, right? That time when Mary and Martha came to him. The second time he wept was uh, concerning Jerusalem. He says, my city is going to fall. And he was weeping for the heart of God. Now, if you see the weeping for Lazarus, when Mary and Martha met him, it is not he was crying. He was virtually, if you read scriptures, if he was angry, he was disappointed that Mary and Martha, who knew Yeshua very well, and who knew it was a son of God, that he could not raise Lazarus. So that weeping was not weeping sorrowfully. He was mad, actually. He was sad. But the real weeping, where he shed tears, was for the city of God, Jerusalem. So we know that he was crucified in Jerusalem. We know he started his ministry in Jerusalem. And we also know that he resurrected from Jerusalem. And we also know as Christians that he's coming back to Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives. He will set foot right at the end time, Revelation, and the, the coming of the Messiah. He will take place when he steps into the Mount of Olives. So over and over again, for the Christians, Jerusalem is very important than any other city. That's why he commanded that everyone, that you have to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, what has happened today in the 21st century, there is a lot of anti-Semitism building up in, even among the churches, even among uh, the Christian community. If I tell you, anti-Semitism actually started, started within the camp. The first anti-Semite in the Bible was a Pharaoh. If you see, a Pharaoh did not want the Jewish community or the Jewish people to expand. And he gave a decree to kill all the firstborn or the young or the males who were born at the time in Egypt. And if you read the historians, if you check records, over about a million of Jews who were born and who were the male, first males were assassinated or thrown into the river Nile. If you see from uh, Pharaoh and we go to Haman, we go to, we see how Esther uh, and Mordecai rescued the Jewish people. We see over and over again on the time of Babylonians, when the Babylonians invaded and destroyed uh, Jerusalem and took their temple artifacts into Babylon. And they killed, according to historians, Nebuchadnezzar has killed almost about 20 million people. So out of that, he tried almost about a million Jews would have been assassinated or killed. And if you see the time of Jesus, we see how Herod uh, killed all the young, the firstborns, right? Or then if you go to the uh, 1700, 1793, 1794, the Spanish Inquisitions, where Spain decided to uh, discard all the Jews from the Spanish enclave, uh, from Portugal, from Spain, and they started killing them, and they chased all the Jews from Spain. Uh, in 1800, we see 1804 and so on, we saw the Russian Inquisition, where Russia started uh, getting rid of all the Jews. In our generation, I believe in our parents, in your parents, we were not uh, born, uh, unfortunately. Um, but the parents who were born during the 1930s, we saw how a megalomaniac, how a maniac, how uh, one who was, uh, who was determined to eradicate all the Jews from the surface of this earth. His name was Adolf Hitler. And he killed, according to the record, six million Jews who were sent to the gas chambers. 
If you see in history, every time, wherever the Jewish people were raising their head and they were becoming popular, they were becoming powerful, there is a segment of people, right, who were trying to destroy the Jews, Jewish nation and the Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, the enclave. I would say all the anti-Semite, right, all the replacement theology, theology followers are equal to this sect I told you earlier. So they are also equal to Pharaoh, uh, to Herod, to, uh, if you see from the time of uh, Babylonians, right? If you see the time of Persia, all this time, they have been trying to kill the Jews and to disregard them and to eradicate from the history books. So as Christians, we must know anyone who come against the nation of Israel or the Jewish people or God's city, they are discontinuing or discounting uh, God's word of God. So I just want to emphasize, I will give you in detail, it's a long subject, replacement theology has taken place. This is the biggest problem. If you speak to the Jews today, uh, they say their biggest enemy is found within the camp. If they ask you, they'll say the Christian nations are the biggest hypocrites, right? We know from the Bible days, the, the Muslim majority, most of them, they hate. Now, if you see the Muslim majority, it's not all the Muslims that hate the nation of Israel. It is a radical Islamic nation. Hear me very well. It's a radically, radicalist Islamic nations. Radical Islam will always hate the Jewish people except in the Bible. Now, the biggest problem for the Jews, when we connect, they say the Christian nations are the biggest hypocrites and their biggest enemies. If you see today, the United Nations, the best judge for the world, where the world judges upon the nation of Israel. The Bible says that Jerusalem shall be a burdensome stone in the latter times. That means all the nation will find Jerusalem to be a pain and a thorn in their flesh. So if you see the voting pattern of the United Nations, except for the United States during the Trump uh, administration, all the other nations, almost 99% of the nations vote against the nation of Israel. Now, I will not uh, talk about the Muslim nations or the Buddhist nations or the Hindu nations. Let's, let's look at the European countries. Let's look at the South American countries. Let's look at the North American countries. Let's look at the Christian nations, even Australia and New Zealand and Canada and South Africa and all the Christian nations right around, even Philippines. Every time when there's a vote concerning the Jewish nation, concerning the city uh, uh, of Jerusalem, concerning the settlements, concerning even recently the Gaza war, every vote is coming against the state of Israel. Why? Anti-Semitism has been there. Irreplacement theology in the sense has been there from the birth. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God specifically says, I will bless those who bless you and a curse will come upon any nation, any individual, any church, any organization or any leader of a sect that will make Jerusalem very light. So if you make Jerusalem very light, it's also uh, 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 equals to uh, anti-Semitism or I would say replacement theology. So my friends, do not get uh, into this uh, a bandwagon of to say that church has replaced Jerusalem. Now we know that the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth to reign for a thousand years. I would ask you a question, where will he come and land? Now if you see, when you, when you say the church, right now there are almost about 2 million churches around the world, minimum, right? If you go minimum, and how many denominations? Almost about 100,000 denominations, different, different churches, thousands of churches, different, different brand names. If you see the church today, the church is not united, right? If you see thousands of churches, if you see millions, uh, millions of churches and thousands, hundreds of denominations, uh, denominations, you may say when the church is split and the Messiah can come and the Bible clearly says that he will physically come to Jerusalem, Jerusalem which is physical, which is still, uh, which is still, uh, uh, which is still surviving, and it will it will thrive during the latter times. 
If you see, in spite of the world condemnation, in spite of all the Arab nations and the United Nations, everybody trying to come against the nation of Israel, Israel has thrived. Israel has, yeah. though they have thrived. I hope, uh, um, yeah, yeah, you can ask. Yeah. Yes, yes. No, that's a very good uh, introduction, actually, uh, Pastor Mohan, uh, because it's very important. Uh, I mean, what's going on in the world now? Uh, somewhere in our conversation, we can talk about the replacement theology in the church itself, uh, where you you negate the role of the nation of Israel and, and the people of Israel, and saying that everything that is said in the scripture is about us. And rather than saying, no, God has, still has a plan for the people of God. Now, let's come to that. But before that, you were talking about this over uh, millennia, how these people have been going through various forms of anti-Semitism and, and, and persecution and murder and, and genocide. I mean, you just name it. Uh, they have been going through that for... Uh, for, for more than 2,000 years, uh, easily, even before the Lord came, you can constantly see there was always battles against this nation from the surrounding nations. It's not something that happened in the last 70 years. Now, um, what, one of the popular notions today is, and, and the rhetoric that is going on is, who are these people called Israelites? Isn't this a nation that was established 73 years ago? And didn't they just take the land from the former occupants of the land? Uh, so I think it's very important to talk about, I mean, even as Christians, sometimes we are not convinced whether these people have a right or are they, are they trying to deprive someone else and trying to take uh, the land that belongs to someone by force? Uh, I mean, th this involves even the Temple Mount where the the, the temple used to stand, which Solomon dedicated, and there is a great history which connects all the way back to Abraham. So uh, can we talk about it? Is it something that just came up in the last 73 years as some Zionist that brought it? Or what is what is the history? Let's let's talk about it. You're an expert so, in this. Yes. So, so, so when Christians uh, talk about Israel uh, and the Temple Mount and the state of Israel when they were born, they go into the Google and they will search and they come to conclusions. Now, we all know the nation of Israel was birth, born for the second time on the 14th of May, 1948, right? Soon after the Second World War, right? The League of Nations decided that the Jewish people will have a state of their own. So when they declared a nation called Eretz Israel, the land of Israel in 1948, 14th of May, that means... Uh, up to that time, Israel was occupied by the British, right? Uh, in 1970, 1970, the British Empire took over uh, Jerusalem, Israel, because we know before the Second World War, the, it was up, up to 1917, Israel was occupied by the Ottomans, or which called the Turks, for almost 400 years. If you go to, if you, if you, if you talk common sense for any Christian, for any believer, or even a Muslim who says the Temple Mount and Jerusalem and Israel belongs to the, uh, the, the Arabs and the Israelis came in 1948 and they took our land, they kicked us and we were refugees and they came from nowhere. Let me tell you, the biggest lie in the history is not for even the Christians and, and for mostly for the Muslims not to accept the Jewish state. If you ask for the Muslims, I must tell you that Islam or Prophet Muhammad was born and Islam as a religion was created soon, mostly almost about 500 years, 550 years later than the birth of Jesus Christ, Yeshua. So therefore, when Yeshua was there, there was no uh, na na name for, uh, Islamic nation. There were no Muslims because Prophet Muhammad or uh, Islam was not born, right? A Muslim religion was not born. So that means we know that the birth of Jesus Christ or Messiah or Yeshua, when he was there, there was no talk of the Muslims or a mosque ever mentioned because Prophet Muhammad was not born. Okay. That means before Jesus, before Yeshua, 2,000 years ago, 
If you go back to the history books, we know even Jesus never spoke from the New Testament because New Testament was not written during the time of Yeshua, Jesus, because he always quoted from the Old Testament. Whenever he quoted, whenever he went to the synagogue, he opened the book of Isaiah, he opened the book of Psalms, and he wrote, he wrote, he spoke from the Old Testament. So there was no New Testament when Yeshua spoke. So for the Muslims, for them to say, oh, the Temple Mount belongs to us, the Jewish people, they don't know the history. If you see the world, if you ask the world uh, from a Jew, Jewish scholar or a rabbi, or if you go from the Bible, if you see the age or the birth of Adam, from the birth of Adam today, if you see how many years is it, oh, how, how many years is the world old since the birth of Adam? It is exactly 5,781. Now, the problem that we have is we are going by the Gregorian calendar, right? We are going by the Gregorian calendar. For the Gregorian calendar, today is year 2021, right? But for the Hebrew calendar, if you are a Bible scholar, if you are a Bible student, you must go by the dates where the nation was born, where the world was created, where Adam was created. The year was 5,781. Now, if you go for the first Jew, right? The first Jew, according to God's word, is Abraham. He was an old, he, he was an old man, but when he came and he fulfilled God's promise, he, he came to Zion, he came to the nation of Israel. He was the first Jew, right? Abraham. Now, if you see the Bible from Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, and the descendants up to David, and so forth. And if you see, even for the Christians, we know King David was the most popular, and the most popular and the most powerful king in uh, Israel. He, re he ruled from Jerusalem, and he was world famous. So therefore, even when he was ruling, there was no mosque, there was no uh, Islamic religion, there was no a Muslim nation as born. So we, as we go to, uh, if you go to history, uh, we must understand the 1948, 14th of May, was a rebirth of a lost nation that was lost for almost thousands of years ago. So the biggest question, that the biggest lie that the world has been told is a Palestinian land has been occupied by the Jews by force. If you see, my friends, there was no Palestine nation, right? Because when the Romans occupied, they gave the Philistina, they gave a name, right? Because they want to insult the Jewish people and they want to take away Judaism and they want to take the Jewish history away from Israel, and they want to assimilate the Jew with all the, the Gentiles, and day by day, uh, moment by moment, uh, inch by inch, they were taking the Jewish customs, they were taking the Jewishness of the, uh, the land of Israel. So they changed the name of Israel, right, to Palestina, and they were removing God's name, God's identity to the nation of Israel. So 1948 is only a symbol, symbolic act, because before that, it was occupied by the British, and the British gave a mandate at the League of Nations. So in 1917, it was occupied by the Romans, not Romans, the Ottomans. So Ottomans ruled for almost 400 years. So that means before that, who was occupying Jerusalem? No one was occupying Jerusalem. It was invaded by various people, but nobody declared is at the capital. Now, if you see the, the, the Quran, where the Muslims right, uh, boast about Jerusalem, and the Muslim says, oh, Temple Mount is the third most holiest site for them. They say Prophet Muhammad went to heaven uh, on a horse from the Temple Mount. It's all a big like lie, right? Because uh, if you see the most holiest uh, city, the most holiest place for the Muslim is Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia. Even recently, as uh, last month and last few months, the mullahs and the religious leaders from Saudi Arabia has openly acknowledged that the most holiest place is Mecca and Medina and the Temple Mount is not in the history books of their uh, Quran. If you read the Quran, there's not one word, not one place as it mentioned the name Yerushalayim, right? Not one place. But if you see the, the Tanakh, if you see the New Testament, the Old Testament, almost 811 times it has been mentioned. How can the, the Muslim people or the so-called people who says 
that Jerusalem does not belong to the Jews, it belongs to the, the Palestinians, where it has not been mentioned uh, even once. They are most holiest book, they are foundation for their religion if it doesn't mention Jerusalem, right? right? So if you see history, if you see history, when God gave a nation, it was found, God gave it to Abraham, the nation of Israel, and to the descendants of Israel. So, so if you see over thousands and thousands of years, if you from generation to generation, Israel has been living there, unfortunately, in 70 AD. We know the famous story where the Romans destroyed the second temple in 70 AD and destroyed, not only destroyed, they uh, actually they made the Jews leave the nation of Israel. There were lots of Jews who have been killed in the time of uh, in, 19, 60, uh, in 68 AD before the temple was destroyed. And with the destruction of the temple, the second temple, all the Jews were kicked out or they were made refugees and they went all over the world. Most of the Jews, they went to Spain, some went to Portugal, some went to Russia, some went to Africa, some even came to India, and some came to uh, Europe, and they were assimilated all over the world. So for 2,000 years, when the Romans destroyed in 70 AD, they made sure, hear me very well, they made sure that there were no Jews in the state of Israel or in, in Jerusalem, and they want to eradicate or remove history so that no one will know in about thousands of years later. So, according to historians, there were only 6,000 Jews remaining out of a population, almost about 3 million Jews at that time. How many? 3 million Jews, only about 6,000 Jews remain. That means they destroyed almost all the synagogues. They burned all their the Torahs, Torah scrolls, right? Now only they have buried some of them in uh, Umran, right? Uh, then they found in some of the Dead Sea Scrolls they found recently. These are the ones that they buried during the Romans destroyed the city. And some of the rabbis, some of the Jewish leaders, some of them made sure that the history will not be uh, taken away and they buried. So if you see, Israel has been there almost from the day that God created the universe. It's from the time of Abraham. So if for Christians, and some of the Christians, if you are see, saying that Israel was born in 1948, it is like for some of the Australians who have come, I, so if you're in Australia, who are the Australians who have come from various countries who have made Australia their second home, and they have become citizens. But if you ask everybody, there are Indians, there are Chinese, there are Sri Lankans, there are Vietnamese, there are, there are Malaysians, all types of people who come and uh, took citizenship in Australia, you can't say that they were born in Australia. Though they have a citizenship in Australia, if you see their history, they are from different countries, right? If you see Australia, the Aborigines claim that they were the descendants. They were the first citizens. In the same way, this is a misconception that we have, uh, uh, we have come to know. So this must be taken out of our mind. Israel has been there since the time of King Solomon, right? Since the time of uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? It is... It is there for thousands of years. You cannot take it away. And nobody can say it is only almost 74 years old. I hope. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> so thank, thank you very much for that, uh, that passionate explanation. Because uh, uh, one of the things that we try to do through these programs is negate all those misconceptions. Because uh, it, it, it hinders our understanding of the scripture. And, and it also... <laughs> Uh, hinders us from aligning with the plan and purpose of God, even as we are living in the last days, because these misconceptions uh, lead us on a different path. Now, uh, since we we are we have limited time, I mean, there's the, this is a topic that we can go for months. I'm sure. Uh, w one of the things that I would like to talk about, since since you spoke about. Uh, the nation of Israel, and, and then it's not something that was born 74 years ago. I mean, you, if, you, if you trace back all the way to Abraham, we are talking about uh, easily 4,000 years. Uh, yes. and, and, uh, and even about the Temple Mount, uh, you can go back to uh, Abraham's time, uh, where 
uh, Isaac was offered. That, that was the very, uh, very uh, the mount that we are talking about, and even in the story of David. So uh, I, I suppose in the in the next episodes we can talk about it. One of the things that I would like to touch upon is that how special is the the people of Israel to God? Because uh, I, I was reading a scripture uh, even as I was thinking about the program today. It was in Exodus. Uh, uh, that uh, in the chapter 19, verse 3 onwards, when you read, uh, God was telling Moses something about the people. And he said, go and tell the people this. And he said in verse 4, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. And now I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, I, I like what he said in verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, Pastor Mohan, I mean, this is God very clearly says that they are a special people above all people and they'll be a kingdom of priests unto him. And, and this is the fact. I mean, a lot of times we, we try to claim it over ourselves. There's nothing wrong. We are special to God as children of God. But Israel has a special place in the plan of God. So uh, for today, if you, if you could briefly uh, tell us why God, Israel is important. Why did God say something like that? What was God trying to do in that place? Okay. So if you say for 3,000 years ago, Jerusalem was built as the capital of Israel. It has been attacked 52 times besieged 23 times, right? Ransacked almost 39 times, destroyed and rebuilt three times and captured and recaptured almost about 44 times. Now, 3,000 years later, it still remains the eternal capital of the Jewish people. Now, let me tell you, now we all know the history of the Jews in the time of Egypt. So the Jewish people, had been there in Egypt for almost 430 years. Of the 430 years, they were not slaves for 430 years. That is a misconception. Mm. Now, during the time of Joseph, Joseph, uh, almost 200 years, they had the best of life. They were given the best land. They were living in Goshen. They were rulers. They were leaders. And they were well looked after. Only when the new king, Pharaoh, came, a new king, then the Jews were persecuted, right? So if you see Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, I believe. So if you see, uh, 230 years, the Jewish people has been persecuted, has been enslaved, has been brutally treated by a king who earlier, a nation who blessed the nation of Israel, right? So for 230 years, they've been oppressed, they have been sidelined, and they've been brutally uh, crushed. So you see, God in his mercy allowed, permitted the Jewish people who came with one person, with Joseph, and it became 70 when all his brothers and the family members came. It built into a, a group of a people. Then it became a population and became a threat to the Egyptians. It became 3 million. And when God wanted to rescue the Jewish people, he chose a representative, maybe a president. Maybe a leader. We know the leader called Moshe is called Moses. Now, the simple reason that God wants to rescue the Jewish people so that they could offer worship to Him and to acknowledge God as their number one, as their manufacturer, as their savior. And God wanted to have a relationship with the Jewish people. Hear me very well. So, after 230 years, when the Jewish people are suffering, if you ask the question, why did God permit them to suffer for 230 years? It has been done so that the Jewish people will know when they come out of slavery, they will be free and they will know it is a gift, gift from heaven and it is God who brought them. So the reason that the Jewish people was told to come out of Egypt, if you read the scriptures, the Moses and Aaron did not just go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. That's what we all say. But the reason that he went and told Pharaoh was what God instructed let my people go that they may offer worship to me. Now, if you see, the Jewish people could not keep the Shabbat, right? Because there was no Shabbat and there was no rest for them. They were working 
200, 365 days, seven days a week, almost 15 hours a day, they were working all seven days. So there was no rest day. So they could not connect with God. They could not offer praises or they could not have a relationship uh, with the maker. So when God told Moses to take them away from Egypt and cross the Red Sea and bring them into the wilderness, he want to make Israel a role model, a nation which will represent the whole world and the whole world will follow this nation which should be a righteous nation, which should be the light to the world and they will have a set of rules that they will follow and the world will be blessed, right? So when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. We know the Ten Commandments was the way God spoke to the Jewish people and God literally wrote it on two stone tablets, right? The Ten Commandments not, are not only for the Jews. It is a model. It is the constitution how to govern the world. If you see the constitution of Canada, if you go and read the constitution of the United States of America, it's, it is almost the same as Deuteronomy chapter 28. It is the constitution has been re, it's been written from the Jewish scriptures. It's almost duplicate of Deuteronomy, right? So that means they, they, they brought in the Old Testament. They brought in the laws of God that God gave Moses into the constitution. Why? It is a governance. It is the way that the world will be ruled. So God made Israel as a role model for the world to follow, and the world will be like the Jewish nation. Unfortunately, the Jews, we know, almost 2 million, except for Joshua and Caleb, all disobeyed God's instructions. Now, the, the misconception that the, the Christians have, when we talk about the Old Testament, uh, we say the Jewish people, they call it the Torah, the first five books of the law, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Now, we must understand that when God gave the first five books, which is called the Torah, he told Moses to come up to Mount Sinai. If you read Exodus, he says, spend 40 days with me. So day and night, the Lord was, God was speaking and Moses heard. And if you read your scriptures very, very carefully, right, word by word, if you see there was almost 3 million people all the 3 million people who crossed uh, the Red Sea at the foot of the mountain, hearing God speaking to Moses. So that means this is the only religion. This is the only book or the first five books where God spoke literally and 3 million witnesses heard him speaking. No other place. So when God spoke to Moses, and God intended the Jewish people to follow and the world to be like that. So if you see the nation of Israel, right? If you see the Jewish people, there are about 8 billion people in the universe today. Now, if you see the Jews, there are only about 14.5 million roughly Jews in the world. We have 3 billion uh, Christians. We have about 1.8, 1.9 billion roughly uh, Muslims. If I ask you a question, who are the richest people in the world? Who are the richest people? They'll say, obviously, what comes to the mind? Whether it's a Muslim, whether it's a Christian, whether it's a Hindu, whether it's a Buddhist. If you ask generally all over the place, they ask a question, who are the richest people in the world? What is the answer? Why would they call Jews? Or they say Jews are the richest people. See, 14.5 billion Jews are much more richer than the 3 billion Christians in the world. And they are richer than the 1.9 billion Muslims in the world. How is it possible? If you ask the people, who are the wisest people? If you ask anybody, who are the smartest people? Right? What do they say? They will say the Jews. Right? They are the Jews. First question, how come Jews? They say they are God's people. No, no. They were the chosen nation. If you see the world, world in the last century, there are three people who change the universe, the world. Right? Now, if you ask who are the three people, people will find it difficult to mention names today in the history. If you see last 100 years, the three people who changed the world are Albert Einstein, Sigmund Freud, and uh, Karl Marx. All three people are who instrumentally the world, the changed the world in the last century. If you ask who they are, 
all of them were Jews. So that means in the last 100 years, if you see the Nobel Prizes, right? Jews, which comprise 0.05%, 0.02% of the world population, 0.02% of the world population, within almost 50% of the Nobel Prizes. How is it possible? How is it possible that the Jewish people who represent 0.02 is a, is a fluke, is a coincidence, or is it an act of God? So if you see today, even the Christians, right, even the world, 95% of the inventions, right, has been created by the Jewish. The very fact, the what we are watching right now, right, even the Facebook, even the YouTube, even the Google, even WhatsApp, even Skype, even uh, internet, satellite, technology, communication, everything was an invention. The creator was a Jew. So actually, the, when God created the Jewish people, he wanted the Jewish people to be a light onto the world. Why would the Jewish people, like the Jewish people, he want everybody to be a, a duplicate so that everybody shall be light. And against all odds, the Jewish people is a race, is a nation that has been persecuted than any other nation in the world, right? If you see the estimate of the Jews killed, if you see estimate almost 700, Jew, 700 million Jews have been killed from the time of Pharaoh, from the time of Herod, and up to 1939 to 45, even up to today, almost 700. How come they have survived? That means God's chosen nation, God's foundation, God's moral laws, everything has been placed there. So if we follow them, the world will be a better place. The most of the anti-Semite, most of the Islamic states will say, oh, Jews are selfish. They are cunning. Oh, obviously, they are smart in their business because they have wisdom. Because one thing that they have been blessed because they do what God has told them to do. So... Jewish nation is a role model for the world. If you follow the Jewish nation and if you keep the mitzvahs, the laws and the principles and the precepts and the instructions that God gave the Jewish people, the entire world, the world will be a better place. The world will be a much, a much more peaceful place. Over to Sudesh. Yeah, pa, uh, yeah, even as you were speaking, I, I was reminded of a scripture because uh, in, in Romans chapter 11, verse 15 says, for if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, their rejection, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So, I mean, even as uh, the Jewish people uh, seek the Messiah and then they're restored to their place, and that's going to be for the whole world, uh, life from death. And that's what uh, God is promising us. Now, we are all almost out of time. Uh, I just want to share with... Um, our viewers that we are we are talking about other important aspects uh, in the in the uh, next few weeks uh, to come. Uh, this is just laying the foundation so that we we have the right kind of start this week just to understand who these people are. I mean, uh, uh, have we replaced them or have we got our theology right? And where do we build it from? Now, there are a few things that um, I would like to discuss next time just to give you a clue. Uh, one of the things that is being said about uh, the, the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, uh, uh, particularly one of the books that written by John MacArthur says, Israel is God's clock. Uh, basically, if you want to know what God is up to, what you need to do is just look at the nation of Israel. And, uh, uh, and, and also like uh, uh, in, in another place, also someone said that God's prophetic timepiece is Israel. So there are, there's a lot of things going on in the world that involves Israel. I mean, Israel being in the news, uh, we know that uh, more than 4,000 rockets were fired over a period of 10 to 11 days in the month of May, and the country still survives. So that's the end of God upon that nation. So next week, one of the things that we will be discussing, among many other things, is why is Israel the, the timepiece of God? Why is Israel the clock, the prophetic clock in the hand of God? And how do we look at the world events and Israel and understand the times and seasons we are in? 
Now, apart from that, you can always uh, send us your questions. Uh, if you didn't put it on the chat, you could always send it to us, reach out to the, uh, the team uh, behind Mountain uh, Movers. And also the link we'll be sending you once again next week ahead of the program. You can type in the questions and then we'll be ready to answer. So we will have another uh, exciting episode next Monday, same time. And we'll be continuing to talk about the nation of Israel. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, Pastor Mohan Viragun, thank you very much. It's very insightful. And you obviously have spent so much time studying uh, the history of Israel and the plan of God in the, uh, in the Bible for the nation of Israel. And of course, uh, there are many things we can discuss, discuss about the future as well. So thank you so much. Uh, and we appreciate uh, what you do to help all of us uh, get on track with the, the timepiece of God, uh, God's prophetic uh, clock. So uh, thank you for everyone who joined and uh, please tune in next week same time, uh, please, you can inform your friends, your church uh, uh, believers, your family, invite all of them. All are welcome to join and you, they can benefit from this. And these recordings will be on YouTube. You can always take the links and share with others. Before we end, uh, Pastor Mohan, may I request you to uh, pray a blessing over everyone on the platform uh, and release us with the blessing of God. Yes, uh, before I conclude, I just want everyone to pray, uh, especially for the Knesset and for the Israeli government. Israeli has been uh, more divided today than any other day in the history in the last 74 years of their modern Israel because a new government is to be uh, shaped. I want everyone to pray for the, the government, uh, whoever who is going to be leading the nation of Israel. That's God's mandate that God's prophetic fulfillment will be done through their leadership and for the nation of Israel, even at Bennett and Lapid and Gantz and Gideon Sah and all the left, right, center parties get together the first time is going to be historical. Some people are against, some people for, but God's will will prevail. I want everyone to remember the Knesset, the leaders who are going to take over, I want everyone to remember the nation of Iran who is trying to destroy, trying to send missiles even before the government is informed. Another escalation from Lebanon, another fire a few rockets from Gaza. Any can, anything could happen. I pray that you will remember Israeli defense forces, the Mossad and the Shen Bet. And on behalf of Christian friends of Israel, Jerusalem, uh, where I represent, uh, I just want to bring greetings to you. So as, you, I, as, a, as a mandate, I will tell you, Whenever you have a meal, whenever you have a meal, you're using your right hand, if they're right-handed. And remember Psalm 137, verse 5, it says, Yerushalayim, Tishka Yemini. If I forget thee, O Yerushalayim, let my right hand forget his skill. Right? So if you have a right hand, the skill is what brings finances to you. Skill is that makes a man. Skill is that make any human being a person because without the right hand, he will be dysfunctional. So he says, if you want to prosper spiritually, if you want to do well in your life, in your skill, remember my city, I will bless you. Not only just remember his city, walk righteously, be in the kingdom of God and do what the Lord has told you to do. So remember the nation, remember the Israeli defense forces and the border posts and pray that the Jewish people will come back as there are a lot of anti-Semitism all over the world, that they will make Aliyah, they'll return back to the nation, and the nation of Israel will be once again shining for the glory of God. I just want to say a word of prayer, and also want to give you the blessings in Deuteronomy chapter, uh, Numbers uh, 623, the Birkit Kohanim, the chiefly uh, blessings that Moses told Aaron to bless. Right? Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just want to thank and praise you for this great day. We thank you, Lord, for Brother John, for organized this, this meeting and created this platform where the children of God, Christians, believers, who will have a great understanding about your nation. Israel is God's time clock for the end times or the return of the Messiah. The other hand is Jerusalem. The minute hand is the temple and the minutes are going. 
whenever something takes place in Israel, the world headlines will be splashing and the world will be excited. When, whenever some things happen in Jerusalem, the world gets more excited and they get agitated and everybody begins to hate the nation. This has been said and foretold and we have been warned. We pray that whenever things take place in your nation, that we'll be more zealous, that we'll be more passionate and that we'll be more righteous knowing very well that your return is imminent. As we pray for your nation and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we pray that your children, your followers and your students will be more righteous and expand the kingdom and keep every instruction given by Almighty God. Father, we pray for the nation's leaders that there will be unity. Even though that they are divided, we pray that your purpose and your will will prevail in Israel than the purpose and the will of politicians. We pray, Lord, as your children pray for the nation of Israel, that they will prosper in their soul and their physique, and Lord, in their health, they will do well. I ask you to bless the Jewish people who are willing to come back to your nation and remove the blindness, the veil. And I pray that every anti-Semitic, every Christian leader, every church, every organization, every world leader who comes against the nation of Israel, Father, open their eyes, remove their scales, and give them a revelation. Father, we ask you, Lord, to bless every Jew. We pray for Israel Defense Forces. We pray for the Mossad. We pray for the Shin Bet, And we pray for the leaders, the Knesset, and every nation, and every leader who is blessing and is favoring, and these children and sons and daughters of God who are standing for Israel, who are praying for Jerusalem, and who have the passion and the zeal for your nation. Bless them and favor them. Yivraka Adonai, Vaish Maraka, Vair Adonai, Panelacha, Vesuneka, Isa Adonai, Panelacha, Vechashem, Laka, Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be glorious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you all and give you his peace. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Pastor Mohan. We really appreciate uh, the time and effort you have put in to share these truths with us. And we look for forward to another exciting session with you next Monday. And thank you once again for everyone. Uh, till we meet on another episode with exciting truths that we can learn. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And we'll see you next Monday. God bless you and good night.